Good morning, Genesis Church. What's going on? Anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, let's stand as we get ready to worship. Uh, I'm going to read out of Psalm 85. Uh, The title of this psalm is Revive Us Again. It says, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Come on, anybody been hot angry, right? Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Come on, I love that part. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Come on, you're faithful. Come on, anybody faithful in the house of God this morning? It draws righteousness from heaven. Come on, pray with me this morning. God, we give you our next few moments. God, we give you this service. We give you our time, our energy, our effort. God, we pray that you would have heaven come down and meet us here in this place. In Jesus' name, and the church said.
king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. students. It's your first Sunday back. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Natasha, and I'm the kids pastor here at Genesis. And for the last several weeks, uh, the kids and I have been up here um, joining in family worship. And actually, we haven't been downstairs since the beginning of March. So we are, hopefully, this is going to be our last Sunday up here. We've loved it, but we're so ready to be downstairs. But I know that that means that um, a lot of you guys I know you love the kids song that we do every Sunday, and you're going to be so upset that, you know, this is probably the last time. So I picked one. Hopefully, we'll get you moving, and let me see you guys get, I want to see your moves, okay? And in, enjoy it. Say his name, watch the darkness slip away. Put your power on display. Say goodbye to fear and shame.
Will you guys pray with me as we go back into worship? God, we just thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you that we're all back. Thank you for all the students who are back, that we can worship together as a family. God, we just praise you this morning. We worship you. We celebrate how good you are. God, how good you've been to us. God, that over our entire lives you've been so faithful. God, and we want to just sit in that. God, rest in that and celebrate that this morning. We're so grateful for how good you are to us, Jesus. We don't deserve it, God, but we, but we love you and we praise you this morning. We lift you high, God, be exalted in Jesus' name.
across this place if you're comfortable if you could just raise your hands as a sign of surrender to the Lord Jesus my life is not my own God we just give you our lives this morning God we give you this school year God we give you God I'm praying four months in advance for 2021 God God, we give you our finances. God, we give you our education. We give you our workplace. God, we give you our family, Lord. God, our life is not our own. Our life is not our own. One of the greatest things that we can do in our Christian walk is to recognize that everything that we have is His anyway. It's all yours anyway, God. And so, God, I'm going to give it back to you because you gave it to me first. Jesus, you first, you first loved me, God. God, you were first faithful to me, God. And, God, I want to return everything to you that is yours, God, in Jesus' name. We're going to sing this again, and I want you to mean it. I want you to really surrender your life. Surrender your life. Surrender your, your mental capacity surrender all your thoughts all your emotions come on my life is not my own to you i belong i give myself i give myself to you my life is not my own My life is not my own. I want to be available. Come on, repeat that after me. I want to be available. Come on. God, we dedicate the next few moments. 
God, we dedicate our attention, our focus, our lives to learning about you and seeking your truth in everything that we do. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Man, can we give it up for the worship team real quick? Come on. That last song is by a worship leader named William McDowell, and he could throw it down, I promise. Um, so that's, a, that's an awesome song. Hey, for those of you that don't know who I am, I am Isaac, and I'm the new youth pastor over the summer. I got hired. They introduced me under the radar, so y'all couldn't say no. So um, I'm excited to be in Bloomington, and uh, I'm excited to um, learn about the culture and get invested into all of you. So uh, welcome to Genesis Church. If this is your first time visiting, uh, there's a big difference between a 9 a.m. service and an 11 a.m. service. The 9 a.m. service, everybody brings their coffee. The 11 a.m. service, everybody's already had their coffee. So everybody's in a better mood. Hey, if you like the second song with the video, I just heard that Pastor Tim and uh, his wife, Miss Jennifer, are going to do a Zumba class on Friday nights with those songs. Just kidding. That's not a real announcement. Hey, but well, what is a real announcement is that 6.30 this Wednesday night, I'm being pulled back in. <laughs> hey, 6.30 this Wednesday night, a G3 Kids, uh, Little Arrows is starting up. So is Legacy Youth. Oh, no, it's not Legacy anymore. It was a Legacy. Now it's Genesis Youth. Observe the T-shirt. This is a brand new t-shirt. You can have, anybody can have this t-shirt, not just a teenager. You can have this t-shirt for $13. Um, I have the reverse of it too, white with the black lettering. $13, it could be yours, shameless plug. But that's this Wednesday, August 26, 6.30. Um, we're excited for that. Hey, and then uh, September the 6th, Sunday morning, we are going to be taking up a special offering um, for our campus missionaries. What we do at Genesis Church, most of you know somebody um, that is involved with Chi Alpha and Campus Ministries on uh, the IU campus. And so we're going to take a special um, offering on September the 6th um, for our campus missionaries. So um, save something, store something up. God is faithful. He will bless you um, if you bless somebody else. So I'm not um, I told a story at the first service that I used to work for Krispy Kreme Donuts, right? And uh, I have a lead foot, and if you get pulled over driving commercially, you don't get to drive commercially anymore. So um, uh, we, I took a, me and my wife took a $20,000 pay cut, but we didn't miss a bill, and we still kept tithing, and we gave some extra offering, and God was faithful to us because we were faithful to him. Amen. So September the 6th, that's when that offering is. Um, and then uh, October 18th, we are having House Church. Come on, uh, all across basically the state, we're going to cover the whole state of Indiana. Um, we're going to have House Church uh, October 18th at 1030. You're going to have a private worship session, and it's going to be awesome, and then there will be, I'm sure there will be some food there. I cannot wait to eat somebody else's cooking, um, so I'm so excited for that. October 18th, it might be chili time. I am one of those people, if you can put noodles in your chili, do it. If you don't, that's fine too, okay? Um, but we're excited for that. House Church, October 18th, we'll have more information as that gets closer. Um, real quick, I want to mention the offering basket back there. Uh, we're not going to pass it because you know Rona. And, but if you have a physical offering, cash, check, or whatever, you can throw it in that basket as you leave. Or you can give at igenesischurch.com slash give. Giving online is awesome. You can do that too. Um, if you would, take out your phones. We're going to do something called Pass the Peace. If you haven't done this, you can uh, just text somebody and say, may the peace of Christ be upon you today. Just let them know that you're thinking about them, whether it's somebody you haven't talked to in a million years, like one of those, you know, followers that you don't really know who they are. You could just say, hey, thinking about you, right? Or um, so you could pass the peace, send them a peace sign emoji. That'd be cool, too. And um, let them know that you're thinking about them. So with that. Uh, lead Pastor Timothy Woodcock is going to come up, and he's going to do Ephesians today. Amen. Come on. All right. Good morning. If you're not awake after Pastor Isaac there, then uh, I don't know what will get you awake. Amen. That's a, 
That's some serious energy. That's good. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to Genesis. Welcome back to B-Town. If you don't know, if you're new here, my name is Tim. I have the wonderful privilege and honor of pastoring this congregation. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's, it's been different the last couple of months. We, we've missed our students. We always miss our students. And um, with the quarantine and the shutting down and everything like that, it's just been a little bit uh, unique. But uh, things are picking back up and people are gathering and I love, love seeing people worship and express and um, encourage one another and hearing the voices. Man, it is so good to hear so many voices here this morning just singing out. Uh, just in our spirit of freedom and liberty, and just a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I, I never want to take that for granted. So here at Genesis Church, um, we, we take a couple things very seriously, very seriously. We don't try to do a lot of things, because we don't want to over-program things. Um, but we, we love to worship. We love to spend time in the presence of Jesus. Amen? And there's nothing, yes, you can worship in your car, you can worship in your bedroom or your living room. But there's something about when the beloved of God, the saints, the church, come together and we corporately rejoice and sing and just join in unison. That it's, I believe, a powerful, powerful, life-giving thing. And so we take worship very seriously. Another thing we take very seriously here at Genesis is the word. We take very seriously diving into the scriptures, and we believe that the word of God is eternal, it is true, it is everlasting, it changes us, it transforms us, it renews us. And so we want to be a people that are full of the word and spirit, and we don't want uh, just all word, and we don't want just all spirit. We want to bridge those together, marry those together, and that's how we mature as good kingdom citizens of Jesus, is that we're word and spirit. And so you'll learn real quickly here at Genesis that we have a culture where people want to dive deep into the text. We love to take notes. My mentor used to say to me, mark your word and your word will mark you. Uh, I'm, all right, none of you thought that was a cool saying. Um, but uh, I remember in, growing, growing up in youth group, there was a quote that uh, used to say, um, religion is young people passing notes to one another. Revival is young people taking notes because they know it takes a little paper to get a fire burning. Oh, come on, somebody. Right, that was a good one. That was worth it. It takes a little paper to get a fire burning. So we love to go through uh, books of the Bible. And here at Genesis, we do a lot of what's called expository preaching. We're just going through books, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I belong in our denomination to a preacher's group, uh, lead pastor's group. And literally this weekend, they were having all this dialogue and conversations around series titles. Who's got some creative ideas for different names for series? And, of course, you know me, I'm like, sarcasm is like my anointing. So I got on there, I'm like, well, uh, we just finished up Romans, and then we're going into Ephesians, and now we're going in the new year to the, the book of Revelation. There's our series title. And everyone gave me like the thumbs down and booze and stuff like that. But we're not very flashy, we're not very catchy, but we believe that the word of God brings transformation to people's lives. And we don't need to be flashy and catchy in order to take the scripture seriously, amen? And so last week, we just finished up the book of Romans. Uh, we were in that bad boy for 12 months total over the course of two years, and uh, we finally got through that. And this week, I am so excited because we are starting a brand new series on the book of Ephesians, all right? Now, this is only six chapters, but we're going to take 12 weeks to get through this, and we're going to dive deep into the text. We're going to learn, and I want to encourage you... Um, uh, take the word of God seriously this year. Make it a, a commitment of your life, a commitment of your heart that you'll say, you know what, this year I want to dive deep into the word of God. I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to uh, wrestle with some things and some tensions in scripture, and I want to become more familiar with what the scriptures actually teach. And so I would encourage you to take it very seriously. And so this, this Sunday we're going to start off with Ephesians chapter 1, but before I get to that, if you go to the next slide here, we always love to give a little bit of context about the book that we're studying. And so the author of this book, uh, we believe essentially is the Apostle Paul. It's a little debate about that, but most historians and theologians are pretty uniform. It's the Apostle Paul. It's probably written between 61 to 62 AD. Many historians believe this is probably why Paul is imprisoned. And so we learned about that a couple weeks ago, how Paul was sent to Rome and he was in prison. Uh, he, he, he could be uh, in prison there, he could be in prison elsewhere, but um, 61 to 62 AD. The genre of this is full of eulogy, rhetoric, and it is called an epistle. And the idea behind an epistle means it's an occasional letter. An occasional letter. So the idea in practicing what's called biblical exegesis is we want to find out what the original author is saying to the original audience and why. 
And then out of that, we want to draw our hermeneutic, our application. Why does this speak to us in the 21st century? We can't go to the scriptures and try to make the Bible mean something that it never meant to the original audience and the original writer. We have to first find out what are they saying, then we draw our application out of it. And so the audience, uh, it's believed to be a general epistle written to both Jewish and Gentile believers uh, in Southwest, Southwest Asia Minor. Uh, most historians believe that it was a circular letter that eventually connected itself with the church in Ephesus. Now, it, it says Ephesians, um, but m many of the original manuscripts did not uh, address to the Ephesians. And so most historians believe it was a circular letter, somehow eventually ended up at Ephesus, and then they kind of took ownership of it as it guided their congregation. Now, next slide here. The purpose of this epistle is essentially threefold. The first of, uh, purpose is that it, Paul teaches about our unity in Christ. And this speaks to our identity. And this is going to be very important over the next several weeks that we learn and discover what our true biblical identity is as sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. And I think this is so important in the 21st century in Western culture that we as Christians are solidified in who we are as sons and daughters in his kingdom. And we understand our identity. Understand this, there is an identity crisis in culture today. And I believe the Bible speaks very profoundly to our identity. Uh, secondly, a main purpose is unity with one another. And so it talks a lot about community. And the idea is if you understand who you are in Christ, a term that Paul uses over and over again, it should affect and shape the way you interact one with another. It's not good enough just to say I'm a Christian and then treat your brother or sister like garbage. It matters how you act. It matters how you talk. It matters how you interact one with another. And then the third big purpose in Ephesians is that of what's called cosmic reconciliation. And there's that word that I love. If you hang around Genesis for any length of time, you'll hear this word like 560 times. Uh, it speaks of eschatology or eschatological things. And that just simply means when we look to the end, uh, God wins. And when we look to the end, there is great hope. And so there's this idea of what's called cosmic reconciliation, beautiful eschatology there. Now, just like in a lot of Pauline understanding, the book is broken up essentially into two parts. Ephesians chapter 1 and 3 uh, deal with orthodoxy and it's understanding your identity and who God has created you to be. Ephesians chapter 4 through 6 deals once again with this idea of orthopraxy and it's understanding your purpose and how God has called you to live. All right? So who God has called you to be and then orthopraxy, who God, how God has called you to live. Now the great commentator and scholar Peter O'Brien says this. He said, Ephesians does not provide us with a list of rules to follow. Nor does it suggest slick and easy solutions to our fundamental needs before God and others. Instead, on the basis of our union with Christ, and thus our relationship with God, the letter urges us to change our inner being and character in a radical way. Every aspect of our lives is now to be lived with reference to our Lord. Now I want to open up with this question here this morning. I want you to think about this. Who are you? Who are you? Look at your neighbor, all right? Some of them wear a mask, all right? And just say this, who are you? All right, now that question is connected to this idea of what do you allow to define you? What do you allow to define you? And this is gonna be important over the, this series is we're going on a journey in discovering what our biblical identity is. Now for many of us in this room, if we're honest with that question, we believe that certain things define us and certain things that are attributed to our lives ultimately become the things that define us. For some of us in this room, our family of origin is the thing that probably defines us the most. For some of us in this room, it's our appearance, the way we look. That's what we think we are. We're tall, we're short, we're uh, wider, we're, we're skinnier. For some of us, the color of our skin, whether Hispanic or African American or Caucasian or Asian, those things define us. For some of us, it's our status in society. And that was big in the first century culture. We'll have to deal with that when we get to the second half of Ephesians, of different statuses in the household codes. Uh, for some of us, it's our major in school. Right, for some of us, it's, it's what we're studying. 
Um, you know, I'm a Kelly grad, direct admit, right? And so you know that about a Kelly person the, within 30 seconds of talking to them. It's kind of like, like the vegans, right? I'm a vegan. Hi, I'm Tim Woodcock. Good to meet you. So, you know, it's just that, those things define them. For some people, it's their career. It's their job. It's their position in a corporation. For many people, especially in America, it's their political ideology. That becomes the thing that, that defines them. For some people, it's their nationality. Like, I, I'm a Canadian. You know I'm going to work it in every sermon somehow. And that's something I'm, I'm proud to be a Canadian. Where we're kind of free. But anyways, um, I, it's, it's my nationality. It's where I was born. Um, for many people, these different things define us. Now, I believe we are seeing a firsthand glimpse of what happens when a society does not understand their true identity and allows the wrong things to define them. Not necessarily not important things, absolutely important things, but the problem is that important things quickly become ultimate things. And we, become, we begin to identify with these things as being our true I, our identity. As followers of Jesus, it is imperative that we have a biblical worldview about who we are in Christ. In fact, that phrase, in Christ, is used 216 times in the New Testament. I want to say that again. It is imperative as followers of Jesus that you and I have a biblical worldview of who we are in Christ. And we allow that biblical worldview to ultimately shape us and form us. It doesn't mean we suppress our culture. It doesn't mean we suppress our upbringing. It doesn't mean we suppress our opinions. But they do not become the ultimate thing that define us in this world. Now, I want to go to Genesis chapter 1 real quick and really look at a passage of scripture before we get to Ephesians that I believe gives us a clear understanding of who we as human beings are. And I want to start out the series by saying this, that the gospel is actually God's gospel. And the gospel began long before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were ever written. The gospel began long before Jesus walked on the earth in the incarnation. The gospel began long before all that, and we actually learn a lot about the gospel from the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. And so in 1, 26 through 27, it says this, Then God said, Let us, and that is Trinitarian in language. See the plurality there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And what we learn about our identity here from Genesis chapter 1, number 1, is this. First off, we are created by God. Meaning we are creation and not create tour. And this is important. We as human beings ultimately are not God. We are created by God. And see the first sin that we see in the garden is this idea of Adam, Adam and Eve where they decide essentially they want to be God. They want to define what is right and wrong for their life. They don't want anyone putting restrictions on them. They don't want anyone telling them what to do. They are independent spirits, and they can be their own gods. And it's important to understand in our identity, we are creation. He is creator. And because he is creator, he has every right to define how we're supposed to live and function within the world that ultimately he created. You with me so far? Secondly, we are created like God, meaning we are representatives. We are created to reflect the image of God to this earth. That word image is the idea of, of a mirror. When people look at our lives, it should reflect God's glory in the earth. This is a big part of our identity. We were created by God, and we are created like God to represent him rightly in the earth. And then thirdly, we are created for God, for the idea of worship, and responsibility. That word dominion, yes, speaks of authority in the Hebrew, but it also speaks of stewardship. It speaks of responsibility. Adam and Eve are entrusted with the resources of the earth. And it only takes a little while before they fail miserably. And mankind has been failing over and over and over again with the resources. People and the natural resources of the earth. 
And we have to understand that a part of our identity is we were created for the purpose of worshiping God, bringing glory to him, but then also stewarding and looking after this earth that he has entrusted to our care. Now, God creates man in his image. He puts him in the garden. And then once again, just a couple chapters later, man decides that essentially they're going to be their own God. Adam and Eve wanted to find what is right and wrong for the world. I remember years ago a young student saying to me, are you telling me that all the evil, all the injustice in this world exists because some stupid man and stupid woman ate of an apple? And I said in that moment, I said, do you not realize that you and I are that stupid man and that stupid, stupid woman that partakes of the apple every single day when we say, you know what, God, I'm fine. I don't need you. I'll do it on my own. This is the sin nature. And because of sin, there's this chasm between mankind and God. It doesn't last forever, but there is this chasm there. And so we must understand that the gospel speaks to the restoration and the reconciliation of that which is created ultimately being reconciled back to the creator. The gospel is big news. It's not just I'm forgiven of sins. That's beautiful and that's awesome. But that's one dimension of the gospel. And we're going to learn this over this series in the book of Ephesians. The gospel is massive, big news. It's that a fallen, created being can be restored back to right relationship to the creator. And not just us as individuals, but as Paul is going to point out, all of creation is promised to be restored back to its rightful creator. Brian Loritz in his book, A Cross-Shaped Gospel, said this, The gospel of Jesus Christ answers all the questions and longings of our soul. Who am I? I am a child of God in relationship with the creator of the universe because of the gospel. Where am I going? My direction and aim in life is found in the gospel. All right, so the gospel is a big deal. Now this brings us here this morning to our text, Ephesians 1 verses 1 through 14, and we'll draw some ideas out of it. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he, and I love verse 8 here, which he lavished on us. Not he gave it in part, he gave us, you know, part A and later we'll get part B, but no, it says he, he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and what? Believed in him. Everyone say it. Believed in him. Him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now this phrase, in Christ or in him, is actually used 11 times in these 14 verses. It's a big deal. It's a huge part to understanding our identity of who we are in him and in Christ. And the trajectory of our salvation is all connected to the idea of are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Are you in the sinful nature or are you a new creation in Jesus? Now let's read it again, verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is a typical Pauline greeting 
of his position not being something that is self-proclaimed, but rather of divine calling of the will of God. That phrase, will of God, is actually used in verse 1, 5, 9, and 11. And Paul, what he does here in this letter is he declares grace and peace over the recipients. And grace is a huge realm in the realm of the gospel. It speaks of unmerited favor. And if we're going to understand the gospel, we have to understand grace and the unmerited favor. And the idea behind unmerited favor is that you do not deserve the blessings and the opportunities and the grace that you have received. You got what you did not deserve because Jesus got what he did not deserve at the cross. It is pure grace that you and I are here today. It is pure grace that we are saved. It is sheer grace that we have been forgiven of our sins and we have an opportunity to be in Christ and therefore be reconciled back to our creator, God the Father. So Paul says grace, unmerited favor on you. And then he says peace. And that peace is always connected in the Hebrew to the idea of what's called shalom. Now, a lot of times we hear that word shalom today and we just think of what? Peace. But you have to understand for the, for the Jew... Shalom was deeper than peace. Shalom spoke of the state of the earth in Genesis 1 and 2 before the fall. The shalom of God was on the earth. And in Eden, and always pointed back to the Garden of Eden, where there was perfect union between mankind and God the Creator. There was no sin. There was no injustice. There was no war. There was no famine. There were no plagues. There was no Rona. There was no racism. There was no prejudice. None of that existed. There was perfect union within the people of God and their creator. That was the shalom of God. It was literally the place where heaven and earth became one. And so when Paul says shalom, he's using a Jewish greeting here. Peace saying what was, there is a promise that one day will be again. And so if you read scripture and what's called the meta-narrative of scripture, that it's one story from Genesis to Revelation, what you see is that there's two bookends. Genesis 1 and 2 is bookended in Revelation 21 and 22. What was in the garden, we will experience again when Jesus comes for his people. It will be a garden city where one day there will be, day, there will be a day where no injustice, no more sin, no more heartache, no more division, no more strife, no more pain will exist in the world. What was will one day be again. And this is big in Pauline eschatology as he always points to the promise of what we can anticipate and look forward to in the future. Now, verses 3 through 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us. Underline that in your Bible. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have what? Redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Now some have referred to this as what's called an exordium. It's a blessing or a eulogy that is actually Trinitarian in nature. And what we see is that we have election by Father God. Secondly, we have redemption by Christ the Son. And we'll get to it in a little bit here. Then we have a sealing on our lives by the Holy Spirit. So it's Trinitarian in nature. It's the God the Father has chosen us. He has elected us. Secondly, we have been redeemed from our sin because of Christ. And then thirdly, we are ultimately sealed by the Spirit. And this eulogy, it begins and ends with high praise for the rich blessings that we who are in Christ have experienced. Each blessing speaks to the trajectory of salvation, election, predestination, adoption, redemption, forgiveness, understanding of the, mer of the mystery, and then ultimately hope for the future. Now, I can't deal with each of those little segments, but I want to look at two of them real quickly to help us better understand the gospel. The first one is what's called election. If you remember from our series on Romans, I, I started that series off by, by sharing about filters of interpretation. Anybody remember that? If you grew up in a Baptist church, Reformed church, Presbyterian church, not all Baptists, but a majority of Baptists, you grew up under a filter of interpretation called Calvinism. If you grew up in a Methodist church, free will church, um, 
uh, Wesleyan church, you grew up in a Pentecostal charismatic church, you grew up in what's called a filter of interpretation called Arminianism. And what we did in that series is I wanted you to become aware of those different filters of interpretation because here at Genesis Church, people ask me all the time, what are you? Are you a Calvinist or are you an Arminius? And I always respond by saying, I'm a Biblicist, right? Because that's what we want to be here. I don't want 16th century debates being forced onto the text. I want to look at the text in a first century understanding. And so depending on how you are raised, you will get to uh, portions of the scripture like Ephesians chapter 1, Romans 9 11, and you will read it or interpret it a certain way. But our desire here at Genesis is to try to discover what would have Paul meant by this to the audience that he's writing to. And it was predominantly first century Jews and Gentiles gathering together. And we must understand that Paul is what? He is a Jew of all Jews. He's a Hebrew of all Hebrews. He's a Pharisee of all Pharisees. And so a lot of times in his Pauline writing, he actually retells the story of Israel. And he uses the story of Israel in the Old Testament to convey what has been filled in the new covenant by Christ Jesus, the true Israel of God. All right? And so when it comes to election, biblically and in Jewish understanding, election always spoke far more corporately and communally than it did individually. And that is important. It's Greek kind of platonic thought that thinks individualistically. Hebraic thought was always far more family, communal, corporate understanding. This is different from Western secularism that you and I are so used to. But in many A&E cultures, ancient Near Eastern cultures, they always thought for the greater good, and many of them even today, of the tribe or of the village or of the family or of the community as a whole. And it's not to deny how the corporate is composed of individuals, but that the plan and election was for the purpose of a people, not so much specifying individual persons. Now, everything Paul connects to in Ephesians 1 here in regards to election, predestination, they are always connected to the concept of what? Those who are in Christ Jesus. So in the trajectory of salvation, and we're just doing a little bit of theology here, stay with me for a moment, the idea of election and predestination is always connected to this big grand idea of a group of people that what? Belong to Christ. They are his people. Ben Witherington, a great scholar, says this about this portion of scripture. He says, when Paul says believers were chosen before the foundation of the world in him, he does not mean that believers preexisted or even that God's salvation plan preexisted, though the latter is true. It means that Christ preexisted the creation of the universe and that by God's choosing of, of him, who is the elect one, those who would come to be in him were chosen in the person of their agent or redeemer. The concept of election and destiny here is corporate. If one is in Christ, one is elect and destined. Paul is not talking about the pre-temporal electing or choosing of individual humans outside of Christ to be in Christ, but rather of the election of Christ and what is destined to happen to those, whoever they may be, who are in Christ. And I, I dealt with this extensively in our Roman series, is that what we see in the Bible is that God elected Abraham so that the purpose of election might be that I want to bring my purpose and my will to the nations of the earth. God's choosing, God's anointing, God's calling, God's election are never about you. It's never about the individual. It's always about what he wants to do through you to bring his purpose to a people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. And that is how a first century Jew would think. So they weren't consumed with individualism. They were consumed with the idea of a people rightly representing Yahweh. All right? And this is what Paul understands in regards to election. Now, the second word here is that of what's called adoption. And a signified entry into a privileged position was usually practiced in ancient cultures only by those of upper positions of status, wealth, and resources. Sometimes if they had no descendants, but often they also had biological children and simply wanted to expand their family and future influence in the world. They wanted to share their blessings and propel others into a great purpose and destiny. Biblically, in the Old Testament, adoption speaks of how God 
chose, elected Israel so that the Gentile nations may be grafted in or brought in or adopted into the family of God, that of Judaism. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant community, this speaks how, how Jesus, who, who once again is the true Israel of God, was chosen, elected before the foundations of the world so that the church, all who believe and are in Christ, might be adopted into the family of God. So what does all that mean? Simply put, here's the big idea behind election and adoption in Paul's understanding here. A good and holy God foreordained before time began to begin that he would make a way through his chosen son, his elected son, Jesus, for all who believe and follow him to become a part of the family of God, to be adopted in and therefore become his family, his people, a holy nation, the elect, adopted sons and daughters in his kingdom in order that his influence in the world may expand. That's what we see pre-fall in Genesis 1. I've created you in my image, and my desire is that you would expand my glory and the shalom of God in the earth. God foreordained, he knew that mankind would rebel. And so before time began to begin, he elected Christ, the Son, Jesus, to become the eternal sacrifice, making a way for all who believe, put their faith, hope, and trust in him as Lord, to be welcomed in, to be adopted in, to be grafted into the family of God. And in ancient culture, the, the adoption gave you full rights and authority and all the resources of that family. God has a, had a desire to bless the earth with his many children. And to see this earth flourish. And despite our rebellion, God is never on plan B. Come on, somebody. Despite our disobedience, God is on plan A. And he foreordained before time began that there would be a way because of Jesus, the elect, the chosen one, for all that are in him, not in Adam, in him, can become that family adopted and rightly represent him in the earth. And so the gospel, the reason I say is big news, because it's not just about you getting saved and forgiven of your sins and getting your get out of hell card. The gospel is about you coming into your identity of who you are in Christ and living on mission in a world to bring his glory and his fame and his kingdom into this earth that desperately needs it. Beloved, the gospel is big, big news. Amen? And so every one of you who are in Christ, you are the elect of God. You are the family of God. Your sons and daughters. Let's read on. Verse 9 and 14. Paul says, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on, I love that, in earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. I love that part. And believed in him. I want to say this just for some clarity. Faith is not a meritorious work. Believing in God is not you earning your salvation. Believing in God is faith expressed to the response of the free gift that is offered to you. And so every person in the world, I believe, has absolute opportunity to respond to the grace that is offered because of faith. And it's not them earning their salvation in any way. It's them simply responding to the grace that is offered. Now when Paul speaks of the mystery, for Paul, mystery was always something that was hidden, but has now been unveiled or made known, known through Jesus. And what this means is that Jesus essentially is the full revelation of how God is and what his ultimate plan is. The plan is that God has worked and is still working to bring about reconciliation to all things, both in heaven and earth. 
And this is all happening through Christ and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And so for the first century Jew, mystery was always tied to the idea of what is God's plan for the earth? And what is God like? If God is perfectly holy and just, then I can never have a relationship with him because I can never be perfectly holy and just. So how is God going to work and orchestrate things so that I may be restored back to right relationship? Because they learn really quickly it doesn't happen through the law. They tried and they failed miserably through the law. The law was given to what? Reveal sin, not deal with sin. Hello? It was given to reveal your fallen and in need of a savior. No person could ever be saved through the law. And so they understood that. They understood and they had all these questions about, well, how is this going to look and how will it work and what is God actually like? And what Paul does here is he reveals that that mystery has now been unveiled. If you want to know what God is like, he's like Jesus. If you have confusion about God, look to Jesus. And what that means is when you read the Gospels and you see how he taught, how he spoke, how he interacted, how he cared for the poor and the needy and he cared about injustice, how he loved even his enemies unto death. What Paul says is that's the mystery revealed. That's the heart of God for humanity. How he conquered death, hell, and the grave, that's, that's God's heart. That hell would be swallowed up in victory because of Jesus, right? And so that's the mystery revealed. Secondly, this word seal that Paul uses, next slide here, in the Greek, it speaks of ownership, it speaks of acquisition of, or an identification of where one belongs. And this is big. Paul says you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. When you respond in faith, when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, comes and resides inside of your life. He dwells in you. He habitates. He makes your physical body a temple of his spirit. And he now lives in you. And that is a seal that you are now owned by God. And it is also a seal of where your true identity belongs. And so I'm not just a Canadian Christian or an American Christian or an Australian Christian or a European Christian or an African Christian. No, I'm a son and daughter that's been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that is where I find my ultimate identity is this making any sense? It's a big word Paul is using there. It speaks of that ownership. He has bought you. He has brought you out of, and he has given you this seal of approval. And in adoption, many times, what would happen is they would give the adopted sons and daughters a coat or a garment or even a seal that said, this is my son, this is my daughter. Beloved, do you not understand? This is huge in the realm of the gospel. That when you put faith in Jesus, you now have the seal from heaven on your life. God looks down on you and he says, that's my son. That's my daughter. I've adopted them. I've grafted them in. I've brought them into my family. They're one with me. They have access to all my resources. They have access to heaven. They have access to healing. They have access to love. They have access to wholeness. I have a seal on their lives. And it's given by the Holy Spirit. Paul says that the seal is essentially a, a down payment or a deposit meant to point believers towards what is ultimately promised as our inheritance and the final consummation of all things. Now this portion of scripture is full of, once again, eschatological hope for the believer. It reveals a realized eschatology as well as a not yet fully realized eschatology. And it is meant to encourage believers in the midst of whatever they are facing, of not just what is promised for them in the future, but also it's meant to encourage them in what authority they now possess. And this is big in Pauline eschatology. Because of Jesus, because you're in him, you have great hope for the future. But understand this, the seal is on your life. Therefore, you have authority here and now. You possess authority as a follower of Jesus. Once again, the great scholar Peter O'Brien says, this passage to which the rest of the letter has been pointing integrates appropriately within the already not yet poles of Pauline eschatology. Christ's triumph over the powers has already occurred. I love that. Christ's triumph over the powers has already occurred. Like, can I get an amen in here this morning? Can I get a witness in here this morning? 
Christ's power over the, Christ's authority over the power, his triumph over the power has already occurred. Because a believer's union with him and, and his resurrection and exaltation, they no longer need to fear the powers. Oh, beloved, hear that. Because of what Jesus has done, you no longer need to fear the powers. The real pandemic in our world is, is not a, a virus. The real pandemic in our world is absolutely fear. And let me be clear, that's not to negate the seriousness of the virus. It's not to say that we don't walk in wisdom. It's not to say that we try to test God and live foolishly. But do not understand our world has been gripped by fear. And it's on both sides, y'all. Both sides. Screaming at the other saying they're fearful. You're just as fearful just for different things. You're just as worried. You're just as anxious. When Paul says because of what Christ has done, we don't need to fear these powers. The fruits of Christ's victory have not been fully realized. However, those in him possess all the resources needed to resist the influences and attacks of the devil and his hosts. Believers must be aware of the conflict. We must be aware of the conflict. We are in a fight. We are in a battle. And it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against our brother and sister. It's not against our neighbor. It's not against political ideologies. We are in a spiritual battle. And are we awoke to it? Are we aware of what's happening? Believers must be aware of the conflict and appropriate the divine power to withstand them. On the final day, Christ's victory over the powers will be consummated. Now I want you to note this. and I'm almost done here. In Jewish eschatology, there was a common language used to speak of what's called this age, which represented Satan's rule and reign, and then secondly, the age to come, which represented God's rule and reign. And this became big language in the, what's called the intertestamental time. Out of Babylonian captivity, the Jewish people wondered, okay, we've been oppressed, we've been ruled by godless people and pagan people, how long, O oh Lord, will this last? God, when are you going to break into the spirit of this age and bring in your age? When is the rule and reign of Satan going to be done away with and the rule and reign of God going to be promoted? See, in the garden in Genesis 3, the authority, the keys of dominion were given to who? Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, they did what? They surrendered the keys of authority to who? The serpent. Serpent came to Adam and Eve in the wilderness. In Matthew 4, the second Adam, Christ, is in the wilderness. The serpent comes to him. And one of the temptations is he shows him what? The kingdoms of the world. And he says, I will give you all these if you just bow down and worship me. What was Satan kicked out of heaven for? Desiring to be God. Desiring to be worshipped. He's still struggling with the same thing. Jesus knows that's not the way of the Father. That's not the cup of the Father. See, Satan knows Jesus came to take back what is rightfully his. But it involves drinking the cup of suffering. It involves the sacrifice. And so mankind surrendered over the keys of authority and thus ushered, ushered in the time of this age, Satan's rule. Satan, the serpent, he is the, the deceiver, he is the accuser, but he's also the prince of the earth. And for the Jewish, eschatological hope is, how long, O oh Lord, when will we come when will you redeem your people? How long will be, we be oppressed? How long will they mock us and rule over us in ungodly ways? How long, O oh Lord? When will the ace come? Come to this age. And so what Paul reveals in so many of his letters, and obviously so in this portion, is that the age to come has already broken into this age. However, its effects have not been fully realized and won't be until Christ comes again. But we who are truly in Christ must remain diligent to live in the spirit of the age to come and not be overcome by the spirit of this age. We fight not against flesh and blood, but we appropriate the finished work of Jesus in our lives so that we may walk in his eternal kingdom even here and now while well, the spirit of this age remains. Next slide here. I have a chart. Hopefully it will help you visually. And this explains Jewish eschatology and really Pauline eschatology. The bottom line, 
is the, the time of this age, Satan's rule and reign. The beginning there up until that dotted line is this idea of how long, O oh Lord, will this exist? How long will Satan have his way? Because even the Jewish people, they eventually begin to understand it's, it's not the Assyrians that are our real enemies. It's not the Babylonians that are our real enemies. Our real enemy is the devil. The spirit of this age behind the evil and corruption within the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Well, they understood the covenant with Abraham. Many of them got that. And the idea behind that is like, oh God, they're my enemies, but you love them. Hello? They're the oppressed, but, but you do care for them because your heart is for them. And so the spirit of this age is going. But the dotted line shows that when Jesus came, he died on the cross. He became the beautiful exchange, the substitution for our sin. He conquered death, hell, and grave, and he rose in power, defeating the spirit of this age. And thus, ushering in the beginning of the age to come. At the cross, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the age to come was, in fact, inaugurated. And the kingdom rule and reign of God has begun. But there's this parallel where they're running together. Where Satan was defeated at the cross... But he still exists in the earth, and he knows his days are numbered. He knows he's a defeated foe. He knows there's a time coming when what was begun at the cross will be fully realized in the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. And that word parousia doesn't mean escape. It means arrival. It's the full arrival of the kingdom of Jesus. And at that point, the spirit of this age will be cast into the pit. And there's different ideas on the millennial reign, but there is a final judgment coming, which the age to come will have full rulership, and the spirit of this age will be completely judged and done away with. And we, as the body of Christ, as those that are in Christ, we live in this time between the dotted line and that parousia, the time between the times. And we are called to think, we are called to function and live and act, not in the spirit of this age, Satan's rule and reign, not in the way of the world. We don't function like the world, but we're called to a higher plane, we're called to a higher level, we're called to a new dimension, and it's the kingdom of God. The ace to come has come and broken in. And I want to live and I want to be and I want to function within that realm. And I have to be resilient about it because it's so easy to fall back into the flesh, the way of this age, and to think in the way of the flesh and get consumed by all that. You know, why are we so consumed about the evil in the world? It's the world, y'all. They're lost, they're broken. I'm not worried about the evil in the world, I'm worried about the evil in the church. I'm worried about the church functioning in the spirit of this age. I wonder why we have so many problems in culture in the world today. Because the bottom line is we as a church fail. And we wonder why pseudo groups rise up and try to accomplish kingdom things without a king. It should be a healthy critique of the church. Whether all the agendas and motives are right, and they're not. But at the heart of it is there's something wrong here. There's injustice here. And we fail miserably as a church. Because we begin to function and live and abide in the spirit of this age. Rather than as those that are in Christ. Sons and daughters in the kingdom. And beloved, we, we have got to fight for that higher realm. Not against each other, but in the spirit. And wherever we see things that are functioning in the realm of this age. First of all, let's just start in the church right now. <laughs> because repentance starts in the house of the Lord. We need to say, no, that's not us. That's not our seal. That's not how we live. That's not how we talk. That's not how we interact. We're contending for the age to come because it's begun and it will be fully realized. Greg Boyd, next slide here, said this. In his book, God at War, and he has some theological perspectives that I wrestle with, that I struggle with, but I read them anyways because he's got some great perspectives. He says, modern Christians are inclined to not expect evil and so are baffled but resigned when it occurs. New Testament writers, on the other hand, were inclined to expect evil and fight against it. Modern Christians attempt to intellectually understand evil, whereas New Testament writers grappled with overcoming evil. That's a powerful quote. We're trying to figure out why so much evil and injustice in the world 
On this side of eternity, we'll never fully know. We know it's connected to the fall. We know it's connected to brokenness. It's all connected to Satan. But I don't want to try to intellectually understand it. I want to overcome it. Because that's my inheritance as a son and daughter in his kingdom. And so we're in a fight. We're in a battle. It's wartime. It's not peacetime. And once again, it's not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. It's against the spiritual realm. And the church better wake up. Better wake up. And realize we've been in a slumber for far too long. And it's taken some crisis to bring some things to the forefront. And wake us out of our slumber. And realize, oh my goodness, we have been living and functioning in the spirit of this age far too long. Beloved, I'm calling you to a higher level here this morning. I'm calling you to another dimension, and it's the kingdom of Jesus. And when we function and live and abide in the kingdom of Jesus, it doesn't matter what we face in this earth. Ultimately, our true allegiance is to Jesus as Lord. No matter what happens, it's not going to cause me to come down to this earthly level. I'm going to live and abide in this spiritual level, because I have that seal. So... As I close this morning, two real practical things from this text here today. Connected to this question, how do do we overcome evil? Number, Number one, we know our true identity. We know where our allegiance lies. Remember, all those things, they contribute to our shaping and our formation, but it's not our true identity. Our true identity is we're sons and daughters. We've been adopted. We have an identity in Christ. We're followers of Jesus first and foremost. When we get to the book of Revelation, we have a big idea there in Revelation is who are you marked by? Are you marked by the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world or are you marked by the beast? Where's your allegiance? And the beast was the emperor. It was the system. Who are you marked by? And John the Revelator is saying, no, that the people of God, the faithful ones, they're marked by the lamb. For the rest of you that are trusting in the systems of the world, the emperor, the, the empire, your allegiance is to that. And then secondly, and this is such a basic one, but it's something that we have to keep bringing to the forefront of our minds. Persistent prayer. How do we overcome evil? Knowing our identity and secondly, persistent prayer. And persistent prayer is calling on the kingdom of heaven to come and the will of God to be done in every situation that still resembles the spirit of this age. You know, COVID has brought to, the, to my attention how powerless the church has allowed itself to become because bottom line is we just don't pray enough. Young Yi Cho, a great Korean man of God, said that the church in America has more conferences and workshops and sermons on prayer and yet does it the least. We talk about prayer, we teach about prayer, but we just don't do it enough. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. And the way we battle, this is how I fight my battle, by knowing our identity and praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The spirit of the age to come, breaking into this age. And so when I see my city, Bloomington, and upheaval, and it breaks my heart, a city I've been committed to for the last 20 years of my life, and it breaks my heart, I can get mad, I get angry, I try to accomplish things in my own strength and will. And I'm not against peaceful protesting at all. But the ultimate response of the body of Christ is prayer. So I got down on my knees last night. I just began to call on God. Lord, let your kingdom, let the shalom of God come to Bloomington, Indiana. Never negate the power of prayer, beloved. Lord, I know there's division. I know there's strife. I know there's healing that needs to happen. I know there's differences of opinions on things. But Lord, would your kingdom come and your will be done. And would the justice of heaven come to this earth. That's more powerful than any sign I can hold up. It's more powerful than any Facebook post or statement I can make. Where's your identity, people? Where's your identity? Are you a follower of Jesus first and foremost? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And so let's forget, even on a 
corporate level. Let's bring it to an individual level. When there's injustice in your life, when there's anxiety, when there's fear, when there's worry, when there's pain, what's your response? I'm going to begin to work it and try to make it happen? Or are you going to go before God and begin to pray? And pray, Lord, would you bring the spirit of the ace to come into my situation? Would you help me to rise to a higher level? The way of the kingdom the spirit. And would you help me to bring your influence in the world? Once again, Brian Lawrence, he said this. Next slide. And I close with this. Every day I spend not praying is another day I tell God, I'm good. I don't need you today. Come on, people. We need a praying church to rise up like never before. Every great awakening was preceded by crisis. I believe we are on the verge of a third great awakening if we will wake up, understand our identity, and we will begin to call on God to send revival. That's what's going to heal our land. That's what's going to heal broken hearts. That's not me being shallow. That's not me just being, oh, you're just trying to... No, if you understand the true power of the gospel, it works, it works, it works. You cannot have a kingdom, a utopia, without a king. And the problem with secularism is they want a kingdom without a king. And we as the people of Jesus are called to a different plane. So we've got to wake up. Amen? We've got to wake up. Let's stand. Every day I spend not praying, then another day I tell God, I'm, I'm good. I, I don't need you today. So we're going to put into practice what we preach right now. Luke, if you would come back, we're going to spend just a couple minutes, and we're going to turn this entire place into a house of prayer. I'm just going to talk about it. We're going to do it. So maybe you're here this morning, you have a situation in your life that you're anxious about, that you're worried about, that you're consumed by, and you're thinking, you're, you find yourself quickly falling back to the flesh, which is the spirit of this age. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit is here to say this morning, he's calling you higher. He's calling you higher. He's calling you to a higher place. He's calling you to a different realm. And it's the way of the kingdom. And so what you've got to do is you've got to appropriate the authority you've been given as a son and daughter. And you have to take that anxiety. You have to take that fear. You have to take that thing that is bogging you down. And you've got to say, I give it to you, God. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Maybe it's worry about your future. Maybe it's, you got a decision to make. Maybe it's relationally. There's a strife in the family. Um, maybe it's financially. Maybe you got a need, right? I, I know this for our missionaries, this is the hardest time to be raising the support, isn't it? This is a difficult time to be raising the support. And the natural and the spirit of this age, it looks impossible. But you do not function in the spirit of this age. You function in the age to come. And with God, all things are possible. Amen? And so I don't, maybe it's in your workplace. There's just strife. Or maybe you've lost a job. Or your, your sources of income are just dwindling. You're looking at your finances. And you're doing your buds. And you're like, oh, my goodness. I don't know how we're going to make it. That's a normal feeling. That's, but I want to I encourage you. I'm calling you higher here this morning. Come on. The Spirit is here. And He's calling us higher. Come up here. Come up now, my beloved. Stop looking and seeing and thinking in the way of the flesh, the way of this age. Let's, let's go to the higher realm in Jesus. Like, is this connecting with anyone here this morning? All right, so right now, I, just, I want you to just close your eyes, not because it's spiritual, because it helps us focus. I want you to take your need. I want you to take your situation. And I want you to give it to God. I want you to present your request. Make it known to Him. And call on the spirit of the age to come to come break in. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, Jesus. Your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. 
in these situations as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, come. Take us higher. Call us higher. Help us to live and function in the way of the Spirit. Help us to resist the way of the flesh. Holy Spirit, come. I want us to just begin to pray for Bloomington right now as we transition from individual needs. Let's, whether you're a student, whether you live here, whether you're new here, I, I just want you to call on heaven for our city and our community right now. Well, just begin to take the authority you have in Jesus to call on heaven for Bloomington. We, we need a move. We need a move of God. We need a move of God in this community. We need a move of God in, this, in the churches. We need a move of God at Indiana University. We need revival to come. We need revival to come. Come, Holy Spirit, in our city. Come, Holy Spirit, in our town. Make a way where there is no way. Bring the shalom of God to this community. Let light invade darkness. Let truth prevail. Let hearts be restored and reconciled one to another. Come, Holy Spirit. We desperately need you. And would you bring revival in this day and age? Would you send such a move of your spirit to this campus, Lord? We know you've been doing it, but we want to see it on an increased measure and in an increased level. And Lord, I'm just declaring that in the midst of all the weirdness of the coronavirus and how school is functioning, I pray there will be such a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. And that people would turn out, out away from darkness and they would come running to light. And Lord, that you would make the right connections for people. And people would lay down their life of sin and their life of debauchery and their life of brokenness. And they would come running to the mercy seat of Jesus. And they would make you Lord of their lives. Lord, I'm believing for many salvations this year at Indiana University. Many salvations. I'm believing for the oppressed to be set free. I'm believing for supernatural miracles, signs, and wonders to happen, Lord, as people engage in a one-on-one -on -one way, and in a small group discipleship way. I pray for many testimonies to come out of 2020, of how you moved, how you showed up. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Bring revival to our generation. Renew your deeds in our day, Lord. Renew your deeds in our day. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's close with this song here this morning. Senor, oh Lord, Again, send your rain, oh Lord. Send a rain in your spirit. And send your Send your rain one more time this morning. Send your encourage you let that prayer be an anthem of your heart. In fact, I want to encourage you this week, every morning when you get up, recite the Lord's Prayer. And when you get to the part, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, say in my life, in my sphere of influence as it is in heaven. I, I substitute myself into that part all the time. May your kingdom come and your will be done in Tim Woodcock's home and my children's parts in Genesis Church in Bloomington, Indiana, as it is in heaven. There's power in that. Bless you. Have an incredible, incredible week. Grow in the power and strength of his might.
Go in the authority that you've been given as sons and daughters in his kingdom. And let's infiltrate the darkness with light. Amen? Amen. Martin Luther King, darkness can't drive out darkness. Only love can. Light can. Hate can't drive out hate. Only love can. That is such a kingdom ethic that we need in the church today. Bless you. Have an incredible day.